Good afternoon. Welcome to lunch with folks. Um, just a few announcements before we start today's program. First, uh, this room tomorrow evening is a seed swap. We're building a seed library here at the library. Uh, it's part of the Library of Things. You can come and get seeds, and you can bring your seeds in to make sure we have everything we need. That'll be tomorrow at 6 p.m. And this evening, I believe at 5 p.m., is another game night. So you can come and play board games or video games here in the auditorium with your grandkids or whatever. Maybe you want to play chess. We have all sorts of games. Next uh, Monday, the 30th, so we're starting our Halloween celebration. We're showing a movie about a vampire that I'm not allowed to say the name of. Over here is what might tip it off. And then first, and actually noon is, is this older one. It's a silent film starring this guy. And then uh, at 7 p.m. will be this one. I think I can say we've got a little go see if that helps. Or Bela will go see. Okay, and next week is Halloween Tuesday, so we're going to do the Orshawn Wells Presents Mercury Theater uh, radio show of Dracula. So I will be reading other members of Lunch of Books audience will be reading parts. We'll have sound effects, we'll have treats, we'll have scary things happening right here in the auditorium. And we'll screen our new feature film, which is called The Hempfield Vampire. We're filmed right here at your library by our professional staff, all of whom are first-rate actors. So get your expectations very high. <laughs> November 7th, David 1st, he's the president of the West Virginia Archaeological Society, will be here. And he wrote an article a few years ago called Hiding in Plain Sight, a case study of early accounts of prehistoric remains on Wheeling Island. So when I saw that title, I had to have him come on and talk about that. So we'll be here on the 7th. And on the 14th, our friend David Jabersack with his, with his eight-year-old granddaughter, 10-year-old. Uh, they did a book of poetry together, so they'll be telling us all about that on the 14th at noon. Okay, uh, today <clears throat> we are welcoming members of the National American Defenders of Baton and Corregidor Museum, which is up in Brook County. If you haven't seen it, you should. Uh, when we booked this program, I did not realize that uh, there's an exhibit upstairs on a gentleman named Freddie Ellis. He died on this day in 1944, October 24th. So we'll hear more later. I just wanted to mention that. And uh, so I'm going to let them take over and introduce themselves. And uh, here they are, the uh, defenders of Bataan and Corregidor Museum. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Thank the Ohio County Public Library. We are very happy to be here. In fact, thanks for inviting us. Uh, I, th I think we all know December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor. You may not be as familiar with what happened hundreds, if not thousands of miles farther east in the Philippines and in other American possessions in the Pacific. Imperial Japan also launched an attack against those American held and also British uh, held and French held uh, possessions. There, the most important American possession was the Philippines and the most important of the 7,000 approximate Philippine islands was the island of Luzon. On Luzon was the capital Manila. On Luzon That's was the most, most important, important naval, naval. Uh, base uh, in the Little Harbor, and that's where most American uh, and Filipino defenders were stationed. Once the Japanese attack began, there was no, uh, after their successful first attack, there was no American air power, there was no American naval power to confront them, 
And they're followed from December 8th. Again, across the international day line from December 8, 1941 until the very beginning of May 1942, a combined Japanese offensive with American resistance gradually overwhelmed until at the beginning of May 1942, the remaining Americans surrendered. It was either surrender, starve, or be annihilated, or be annihilated. There were already by many, many numbers here of American uh, uh, prisoners. We are going to say it was, uh, we're making a little bit more of an educated guess, uh, about 40,000 of the defenders who survived, maybe less. Of those uh, defenders, 40%, this is a horrendous number, but 40% of those taken prisoner in Asia Australian, French, British, and American, and Filipino. 40% died over the next three and a half years, approximately. That's how long uh, the war ended, uh, how long until World War II ended. Of those who survived, of those Americans who survived, in 1946, many of them formed what was called the organization that was called the American Defenders of Bataan and Corrigal. We are the, uh, the museum in Wellsburg. It's the official repository recognized as such by uh, the survivors of the imprisonment during World War II. So, I would like to mention here quickly that our first presenter, Mary Kay Wallace, has been associated with that organization, the Defenders of the Time in Rivigore, for two decades. Mary Kay and her husband, George. So who better to begin our program here than someone who has been associated with, has worked with, has gone to the conventions of the Defenders of the Time in Rivigore for the past uh, two decades, and who, although she wouldn't say it, I will, is uh, probably a founder of uh, the ABC organization herself. So, let me introduce Mary Kay Wallace. Mary Kay. Thank you, Mr. You're welcome. My My sincere welcome to all of you, and especially our veterans. How many are veterans here in the audience? Raise your hand. Yay, thank you for <laughs> Today, I will give you a brief overview of the American Defenders of the Can and Curricular Museum, and as well as our founding fathers. Can you hear me in back? Yes. Is that better? Yes. yes. How many have heard about our museum? How many have visited our museum? That's great. More than yeah. The media plays a significant role, and you can find out why. Thank God for the newspapers, the radio, and the TV. Some are aware of them. Half of you in the room. Of the artifacts, books, pictures, swords, maps, and more that we had in the museum. My husband, J.W. George Wallace, was the former editor and publisher of the Brook County Review, a local weekly newspaper. Together, we embarked on a mission creating a special collection and displays back in December of 2001. My board president approached me and asked me if I would accept a few items from a local prisoner of war, Ed Jackford, who served in the Pacific Theater during World War II. This was the start of our special collection to grew, that it grew to what it is today. Over time, this special collection grew with donated materials 
from all over the world, Amsterdam, Germany, the Philippines. The collection included personal stories, manuscripts, letters, books, maps, poetry, artwork, records, films, artifacts, and pictures. I must say what a great privilege it was to be a part of the startup operation and to provide a repository for these precious, precious materials. There were two great forces behind the expansion of our museum. Our founding fathers, Ed Jackford, Joseph Bonner Sr., and A.B. Abraham, along with the media and all their wonderful local coverage, these two combined enhance operations. There was a launch of large contributions when former prisoner of war, Joseph Fodder Sr., released a request in the official national publication entitled The Farm. This quarterly magazine is dedicated to those persons, both living and dead, who fought in the Pacific Theater. Now, this is the coin, and it goes out to all the members. And this was quite a task. And uh, Joseph Bader Sr. put this magazine together before there were computers. And that was a very hard task. His association, Joseph Bader Sr., with the American Defenders of Vietnam and Corregidor was impressive. He held the position of past national commander, consultant for the investment board, convention site organizer and planner for the yearly convention, along with his beautiful wife, Joseph Jr.'s mother, and promoter of VA health benefits for veterans after the war. We have his original letters that he wrote to congressmen and senators, you know, expressing his desire that, that these POWs needed special help. He expanded our collection and because of this notice in the quad, it advanced to a special, from originally a special collection, this size, to a national museum. His son, Joseph Fodder Jr., will talk about the lives of the POWs and, of course, the founding fathers. Ed Jackford, too, worked tirelessly of Wellsburg in the expansion project with his continued contribution of books, maps, artifacts, pictures, and manuscripts. He, along with Joseph Goddard Sr., were active in the official organization. Ed held the title Commander Twice, as well as National Treasure. For the first 10 years, Ed visited the museum almost daily, examining the content. His friendship with Joseph Fodder Sr. was a huge endorsement for the future of our museum. While serving in Butler, Pennsylvania, I, Mira K. Hartman, was, Hartman was my maiden name, was the director of the traveling library from 92 to 96. I met a former prisoner of war from the Pacific Theater. As a teenager, I always had interest in World War II history. One day, I came across a section of local authors at the traveling library, and A.B. Abraham's book was there first on the shelf. His book was entitled, Ghost of Batan Speaks. Since I considered myself a World War II buff, I took the book off the shelf, took it home, and read it. But I was prepared to read about all the horror of the contents. With tears overflowing, I asked God to use me in any way to get the word out. 
A few days after reading this book, I left the traveling library at lunchtime in search of baby Abraham, and I found him at the VA in Butler, Pennsylvania. I put my arms around him and thanked him for his service to his country. To this day, I am still friends with his dear wife, Christine. My husband and I stood up for their wedding. Amy was 96 years of age, and his wife to be was in her late 60s. He was a carrot. <laughs> As a result of our association, he donated materials to our museum, including the invaluable Japanese surrender sword. I have two brief biographical sketches I want to read. Ed Jasper, he was the man, maybe you heard of him, that brought in Bill Lyon, one of the characters in Wheeling here. So, Ed Jackford was a native of Wellsburg and a survivor of the Japanese attack on the Philippines. He was taken prisoner in May of 42 and transported to Japan by the infamous Hell Ships. There he was forced to work in Japanese factories and warehouses. Servicemen endured unending hours of backbreaking work. During his captivity, he watched GIs around him die from brutal beatings, disease, starvation, and torture. He weighed less than 100 pounds when repatriated due to limited nourishment. When the Americans began to bomb Japan, he never knew if he would die of friendly fire as the Japanese refused to mark the POW camps as well as the freighters called the infamous house ships. He worked after the war tirelessly trying to seek recognition and compensation with Sina for those military personnel who were enslaved by the Japanese during World War II. He has written widely of his experiences in books, journals, and newsletters that we have in our collection. A.B. Abraham was the survivor of the dreaded death march of the Taunt. During this ordeal, men were stripped of their dignity and forced to march 60 miles on a hot, dusty road without food and water. Military men were blackened by tanks, hit by Japanese trucks, bayoneted, beheaded by terrorist swords, and shot along the path to Camp Donnelly. Abraham walked the fine line between sanity and insanity on his way, and as well as his fellow soldiers, he talked about how they died. He spent much of his life serving as the link between those who died and their families, providing much needed closure. He published his experiences in two books, The Ghost of the Tan Speaks and No God Would Part You. Abraham accumulated over 38,000 volunteer hours at the VA Medical Center in Butler, Pennsylvania. In conclusion, the war years of 41 and 45 were times of great distress not only in America, but worldwide. As you stated, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, December 7th of 41, impacted the lives of every U.S. citizen. Young men and women rose to the occasion and enlisted in the military. Millions, too, were drafted, but eager to serve. The POWs of World War II will never be forgotten. Our museum is one of the best and one of the finest repositories in the nation. 
for information on the war in the Pacific. Within this hour, you will learn more about the war in the Philippines and the great men and nurses and women who face tremendous odds against enemy attacks, especially the defeat, captivity, and imprisonment. Over the years, I have read many manuscript stories and articles concerning the plight of our POWs, both before and after their imprisonment. I have also have met these brave soldiers and nurses who gave their all to preserve our freedoms. You in the military, you understand every word I'm telling you. I want to thank you for this opportunity to give you an overview of our World War II Museum. I also want to say my husband, the late J.W. George Wallace, was a major force as well in the creation, development, and expansion of the ADBC Museum. He wrote about the museum in the local book review from 2002 until 2014, as well as the font for five and a half years. I am proud of his contribution to the enhancement of museum operations. Special thanks to, to our board of directors. This is our board president here, Richard Lindsay. And he's very shy. And <laughs> I'm not allowed to say this, but I am you. Library Director Richard Lizza, Professor Emeritus of History at West Liberty University, jointly created and currently supervised a history internship program. He and his colleagues from West Liberty created this wonderful program with the colleges in the region where the colleges in the region, I'm sorry, I walked away from the mic. The colleges in the museum, uh, the students in the area went to visit the museum and they preserved and digitized everything in our collection. And it's a vast collection. And I am proud of your contribution. And we look to your academic credentials and as well as everything you have done, we are very, very grateful. And also to two of our board members who have been here and especially supported me from the very beginning. And Paul, you can stand. <laughs> they have shared their jack of all trades. They're there when there's museum issues, library issues, their repairmen, their program coordinators, their refreshment people, their Gail Fridays. We are so proud of their accomplishments and what they have done. And I also want to thank Joseph Water Sr., who is here. He is a descendant of Junior, Joseph Water Jr., who is here to talk about his father, Joseph Water Sr who's contributed so much. And he was a dear friend, an excellent artist, and we have his artwork in our museum. And he's also a Navy veteran. So I am gonna turn it over to him and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Just, just to be clear, uh, I am I am not the artist. Uh, I also can't work a the uh, microphone. I think it went off. It probably turned off when you dropped. How's that? That's good. If it's electronic, it won't work. Thank you, Mary Kay, for those uh, kind words. What I'd like to do is um, read from three uh, authors, one of whom is my dad. Um, he, he did not want to write anything about himself. Uh, his grandchildren finally convinced him 
to write down his story. So this is basically his story as told to um, his grandchildren, uh, for whom he would have never done it for his kids, but uh, for, for whom I am eternally grateful. Uh, second, I'll be reading, uh, the second reading will come from, sound like I'm at church, um, the, the, the death march, uh, about the death march uh, from A.B. Abraham. And a third read, uh, another reading will come from uh, Eddie Jackford's book, talking about his time um, in Japan, uh, working at various uh, Japanese, working for various Japanese uh, companies as slave labor. Um, so I'd like to begin with uh, the beginning of the war. And uh, Philippine Island duty was actually pretty good before December 8th of 1941. Uh, a lot of people wanted it. It was a uh, warm climate. Uh, you only had to work four or five hours a day. Um, but the war came and the United States in general and the Philippines in particular were really ill-equipped uh, at the start of World War II. So I'd like to start with uh, uh, things that my father told to my, uh, to my nephews, his grandchildren. Uh, and I apologize, I usually like to look at the crowd when I'm talking, but I'm not very, I didn't memorize all this. So uh, I will need to, uh, need to uh, have my head down for most of the uh, performance. Nothing in Joe's training could have prepared him for the tough times he would face while defending the Philippine Islands. The Philippines were an American colony at the time and had been since the American defeat of Spain in the Spanish-American War. The Philippine Army was commanded by American officers, including Generals Pershing, Eisenhower, MacArthur, and, a and Wainwright. In the mid-1930s, MacArthur was sent to the Philippines to reorganize their army, and by 1941, their troop numbers had increased uh, to 12,000. Um, Joe was involved in the defense of the Philippines from day one. The 803rd engineers were attached to the Army Air Force. They were sent to the islands in, to build airstrips for the Air Force. They began building one at O'Donnell, a little north of Clark Field, both of which were on the island of Luzon. At the time, Joe was stationed on the island of Luzon. Plans changed quickly, though, when the Japanese landed. The 803rd was ordered to break camp and retreat to the south. My father had almost no training as an infantry officer, as did all of the others who were in the 803rd. But all of a sudden, they became infantrymen. Uh, using World War I rifles uh, and ammunition that didn't work much at the time. Uh, on top of that, the nations were cut in half, his rate rations were cut in half around Christmas of 1941. They were forced to take quinine every day as a deterrent to malaria. Within a few months, they were out of quinine and most of the other medical supplies. At the end of January, they tried to go on the offensive against the Japanese. Joe's unit moved to a landing, or I'm sorry, the Japanese landed behind uh, combat lines. During the offensive, their unit encountered a Japanese 50 caliber machine gun and lost 12 of their men. Joe saved Corporal James by taking him to the first aid station as he was bleeding very badly. Unfortunately, Privates Kenny and Ray were killed at his side. Four days after being ordered to Agaloma, the 803rd left for Corregidor, which is an island that sits off of Manila Bay. It is basically a fortress that was built to defend Manila Bay from attacks from the sea. They were two 12-hour ships reconstructing the airfield while being bombarded with shells from the uh, Philippine city, Cavite, and constant bombings from the air. As uh, Rich alluded to, the, the Americans had no air support at this point in time. So the Japanese were free to attack at will. Um, the 803rd uh, was able to work on Corregidor for a few weeks without facing a direct attack from the Japanese. However, on April 9, 1942, Bataan was surrendered. At this point, the Japanese were able to shell the shore with artillery and shell Corregidor at their leisure. 
The American equipment was being destroyed by the day and their rations were cut again. By that time, they were getting less than one fourth of the rations uh, that they were supposed to receive. Supposed to receive 2000 calories per day. They were now receiving 500 calories per day and attempting to fight a war. Um, the worst of the shelling came on May 4th, the emperor's birthday. That day, the shelling began at daylight and continued until it was dark. Reports from that day count 16,000 shells hitting Corregidor. No area has ever been shelled that much of the day. They couldn't move above ground during the daylight hours. All of their equipment was destroyed. Two days later, on May 6th, the Japanese attacked Corregidor directly. Joe was helping to rebuild the airstrip at the time, and the Japanese landed near the airstrip. Confusion reigned on the island, and a Marine lieutenant uh, tried to set up a defensive line. Joe was setting up a machine gun in an old bomb crater with Sergeant Greer when one of the Japanese threw a grenade into the crater. Uh, so the forces were that close together at the time. The grenade exploded and fragments hit Sergeant Greer in his chest and Joe in the arm. Joe carried Sergeant Greer to the first aid station where he survived. By noon, um, this, uh, they were told to uh, surrender. Now the uh, island of, uh, or the uh, peninsula of Bataan had already been surrendered in April. Uh, and so uh, let me read to you from Abe's book uh, about his recollection of the death march, or at least portions of it. They have asked me to write a book telling the world what really happened. Many books have been written, but they do not tell the real story. Tales have been told by officers and enlisted men concerning what happened. Some made the death march greater than it really was. Many told fantastic stories. Some captured on the other Philippine islands were taking credit for the death march. Why? I do not know. Those left of us uh, who were in it are still trying to forget. The stage for the death march was a set at Marbay, was the southern tip of the Bataan Peninsula. We started the march in long columns of dusty, bloody, frail, and frightened men. This was the last march for many. We marched past thousands of Japanese troops, cavalry, tanks, artillery, trucks, etc. in the broiling sun. As our columns marched past the Japanese, many of them would guff, us, guff at us, jab at us with long bamboo poles, and many of, the, many of them actually waved to us. I saw a Japanese soldier shoot my buddy at the outskirts of Tolonga. He yelled once, glared in utter deep disbelief, and fell over dead. I saw a body flattened by a tank, another was hit by a Japanese truck. I cannot forget the fate of the 91st Division of the Philippine Army. At the junction of Trail 6 and 29, they were stopped by a Japanese staff car. The 400 officers and non-commissioned officers were ordered to stay behind. The rest were ordered to continue the march. Those 400 men were tied up, lined up uh, at the length of a nearby ravine. Japanese officers, samurai swords flashing, announced through an interpreter. Had the surrender been earlier, this would not have had to happen. If you have any request to make, you may do it. Kill us with machine guns, fire, was the request. Their request was denied. Instead, bayonets were stabbed into the victim's back while officers slashed at their heads with their gleaming swords. If a man made a sign on the first thrust, he would be re repeatedly bayoneted until he could make no more sounds. Uh, some sun blackened and bloated corse, corse, corpses were scattered all across the scarred battlefield, filling the hot air with a terrible stench. Thousands were dying of dysentery. Their stools became a horrible mixture of water, fecal matter, mucus, and blood. The death toll climbed from Balanga to Orandi, a distance called death. At one spot, I saw many Filipinos bayoneted and shot. At another, two more were thrown into a well. Some were bayoneted and thrown into graves. When they tried to climb out, they were shoved back and buried alive. I saw Filipinos whose stomachs were opened by bayonets. I saw a Japanese white blood from the saber. At Arani, a Japanese thrust his bayonet at me. 
I moved it with the right thrust and quickly disappeared into the group. He stood in open mouth shot that I knew what to do. He didn't know I had been an instructor uh, uh, in bayonet training. Many Filipinos acted as civilians and made their escape. The heat was so intense that we were half crazed from thirst. We started to drink from a mud hole. Look, a feeble voice rose. A bloated corpse filled with maggots was floating towards us. We stared, shivered, cursed, and got up and continued the march. The, uh, fortunately for AB, uh, he survived that uh, death march. And as you'll see a little bit later, he was, um, he was able to be quite useful in identifying uh, the uh, bodies uh, on, uh, on the death march. Now a little bit about Ed Jackford. He was in, initially captured on the Philippines, sent to Japan uh, by uh, the hell ships. And you'll hear a little bit about them uh, later. But um, a few descriptions of what he was forced to do at these camps. The camp officials announced that men were needed for a slave labor detail at the Mitsui Company on December 9th to assist in unloading a ship that just arrived with coal on its deck. Here the crane would take as much of the coal out that was feasible, then nets were placed in four corners of the hold. Prisoners of war were assigned to shovel coal onto the nets, which were then hoisted out by the ship's steam wrenches. This was a dirty and backbreaking job. Another description of what he was doing on June 22, 50 men, including myself, were transferred to the Nippon Steel Mill POW camp for slave labor in the steel mill. Here we met many of our friends who had just a month ago been transferred to this camp. Conditions in this camp were similar to the Mitsui camp compound, much work, little food, no medication, and poor sanitation. I was at the Nippon Steel Mill from June 22nd until August 24, 1943 when they transferred 29 of us back to the Mitsui Power POW camp we had previous, where we'd previously been interred. During the, uh, during the period at the Nippon Steel Camp, we were all assigned slave labor tasks throughout the mill. At times we moved steel rods, swept floors, or operated the air hammers to clean defects from ingots manufactured by the facility. As for conditions at this camp, they were hardly any different from our previous camp. We had a small bowl of rice and watery soup for each meal. The sleeping quarters were wooden planks, which were rather difficult to get used to. Sleeping on our sides caused used calluses on hip area, which never healed until the war was over. Everyone had swollen ankles from berry berry. Every type of vermin known to man caused as much discomfort, mostly fleas, bed bugs, and mosquitoes. <laughs> He continues, <coughs> excuse me. One year ago, uh, on the 18th of November, we initiated our slave labor detail for the Mitsui company in their nearby dock area. Most of the time on that detail, we carried 120 pound sacks of rice from and to nearby railroad cars. Everyone was happy to work on that detail since we could supplement our food ration by stealing the rice. Um, we also carried small stacks, sacks of manganese on our shoulder from a warehouse into a railroad car. At the, uh, on occasion, we loaded railroad cars with six, six foot long carbon area, carbon hearts, wrapped up in straw using stevedore dollies. As the area was unloaded into the, as the arcs, I'm sorry, we were unloaded into the boxcar, we tried to drop them as hard as we could in an attempt to break them thereby making them useless. We also loaded railroad cars with paper sacks of cement. After placing them in the railroad car, we literally tore many of the sacks apart inside the car, spilling the cement contents all over the inside of the car. And this was not unusual. The, uh, uh, the POWs who were performing uh, slave labor throughout uh, engaged in all sorts of acts of sabotage in an effort to uh, not give the Japanese uh, captors what they want. 
now I'll move towards the end of the book. Um, and this is uh, from Abe's book. Abe never left the island of the uh, Philippines. He was, <coughs> excuse me, he was uh, imprisoned there for the whole time and uh, uh, was part, uh, was in Cabanatuan. And you may have heard of The Great Ray. Um, it was a movie about the uh, capture, the recapture of Cabanatuan and the saving of the men who were there. But this is uh, A.B.'s recollection of that day. Um, in January, and this would have been 1944, we heard loud noises in the distance. Somehow we knew that our Navy was shelling uh, land bases. The smothered boomings and hissing screams ripping through the sideways was music to our ears. The sight of, the sight of excited, frightened Japanese as they exchanged hurried glances and hopped about uttering unintelligible phrases, filled our hearts with more than joy. But when they made a hasty departure, tears of triumph welled in many hollow eyes. Uh, with laughter and loud yells for victory, we too took off but to the Japanese side of the camp, where we stole a lot of rice and three Brahma bulls that our captors had been treat treating with utmost care. The bulls were promptly slaughtered, the rice cooked, and we ate good. We sang songs. We had full bodies for the first time in years, and we knew that the Americans were not too far away. We see singing and sat back, listening to the news coming over the radio that we took from the Japanese. So um, the Yanks proved uh, the, by 7 p.m. that evening, our entire camp was in the throes of great pandemonium. Grab a club, Bill, I called. If they get near us, we can club them and escape or be killed in the attempt. We can't just sit here and have them kill us. He replied, as, he replied and we seized the first thing that could be used in our defense. The way, this way, fellas, the deep voice roared over us. Don't anyone move, I heard the commanding voice of Colonel Duckworth, the medical officer. Who's there, someone did, demanded. Colonel Duckworth, get your fan, fanny out here and I'll apologize to you tomorrow or ordered a strange voice spelling authority. Before we could regain a semblance of composure, we were staring incredulously as many soldiers in green uniforms and strange hats. And you may remember uh, the Rangers had a different hat. Um, just who are they, many gasped. They're gangs, the man cried. And we let our wild cheerings go. They, uh, A.B. was able to, um, survived that raid and um, continued uh, on home. He um, was at, uh, when, he, when he was able to, uh, to get free, he realized that there was an army force heading to Manila. Uh, A.B. was married and had children uh, in the Philippines uh, who were in Manila at the time he, uh, he entered the, the war. Uh, and so he was in a hurry to get back. He literally started, and, and when, as one person said, a, 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 an army of one walking towards uh, uh, Manila after he had obtained a, a rifle and uh, some other equipment. Um, he later made it there. After the war, and I, and, uh, I find this very interesting, um, that he, he was with a uh, group of armed forces and a Japanese major uh, came up to him uh, to, to um, ask uh, if they could surrender. And this is, they were asking to, to surrender to a person who had been uh, in, the, uh, in a POW camp and had been mistreated for all these years. Um, the Japanese major asked for a few days in which he could round up his men from the jungle and set our surrender date. We drove them back to the jungle while the citizens stared at us suspiciously. They stared and stared. They were nobody's fool. They knew that something was going on behind their backs. Five days later at 9 a.m., four truckloads of soldiers and four jeeps left Alonga. Captain Hess and Lieutenant Morningstar were with us. After driving the dusty road for a long time, we entered the muddy jungle and walked. We stopped and waited for more than an hour. 
We can see them coming at a distance of 500 yards from here, someone said. Another 20 minutes passed and the Japanese came into sight. They were waving a white flag. They were a dirty lot of ragged, sick, and hungry soldiers. They all needed haircuts and their clothes were patched and repatched. What was left of their shoes clung together with wires. We loaded them into trucks and drove back to Bolonga, where we told them to take a bath. They were fed and American doctors examined them and gave them medicine. It was a lonely, sunshine day in the mountains in the little town of Bolonga Batan. I sat alone watching the Japanese eating good food, American food, and thoughts of all the warmy rice and pigweed I had eaten in their prisons. I glanced away often, fighting with my inner self. Not more than 50 yards away, 40 men had died on the death march uh, and whom we had disinterred. One grave alone gave up 20 bodies, all killed on the death march. I closed my eyes and clenched and unclenched my fists while a cry for gen gen vengeance tore through me. Oh God, dear God, I prayed, it, prayed silently. Show me how I can love them instead of hating. Show me that they knew not what they were doing. Cleanse me of hatred and bitterness. So uh, they moved to accept the surrender. Uh, and the colonel uh, was offered the surrender sword. He said, I don't have the right to accept the surrender, the colonel said, and turned toward me as I sat alone, watching and fighting the bitterness from my heart. Sergeant Abraham, he said, come forward. I pulled myself up and complied. Sergeant, I believe this honor is yours. The colonel said, much to my surprise, you, you are the only man to return to Bataan. You are the only man who fought in Bataan who is watching the surrender. I saluted the colonel. The Japanese major saluted me. And with feigned goodwill, I returned his salute as soldier to soldier. I am happy to be here, I said, although I knew that neither of us had any love for the other. I'm here on the surrender of the Japanese in tribute to those who died in Baton. Um, that um, uh, sword is the one Mary Kay referred to that is in the museum today. Um, and so with that, I will uh, step aside and bring Jim up to the uh, uh, podium. Uh, Jim is our director at the National American Defenders of Baton and Cricketer Museum. Um, he was a, a veteran, served in the U.S. Navy from 1966 to 77, and has been instrumental in our uh, ability to grow, uh, to maintain and grow the museum. Jim? They took their shoes. They gave us a blanket. Why were you blank? It's cold on the deck. It's hot on the day. You couldn't walk on the deck. 1,700 men were put in the bottom of the hole. We took our canteens. We took our coconuts. I had three of them. I dreamed about these coconuts the whole time I was on the boat. Three coconuts. 1,700 men. Are in the hole. The Japanese are on the top of the hole. They cover the hole. The men are crying. The men can't see. Some have lights that no light. You can't. You can't even lay down to sleep. You sleep in a sitting position. And the stench was so bad that they couldn't even breathe. If you were lucky to take the the buckets up top side, throw them over side from the waist of the men. You got to care. They heard the torpedoes before the captain saw the torpedoes. They were yelling, torpedo, torpedo. And he turned the ship sideways. And the reporter started. He missed the torpedoes. The Americans, submarines, were on the hunt. For the hell ships. They did not realize the hell ships what they were. They thought they were freighters in Japan taking supplies, but they didn't realize there were 1,700 men on the Asian route. 
They would spend days, months, and weeks on hell ships. They would not return to the boat. They suffered. They asked for food. They asked for water. They took the canteens. They took their shoes. Why would you take your shoes out in the middle of the ocean? They took their shoes. You couldn't walk on deck. Somebody died. The body was like a cordwood in a hole. We're taking the top side and throwing it overboard. For nourishment, some, some of them tasted the blood of another man. Mm. That's all they had. They would stop at Taco, which is better known as Kaushan. And the people from Taco would clean the halls of the ships because the ships were used for transporting everything from coal to cattle, and the stoves were still there. 205 breakers, part of the Japanese Imperial Navy. Commandeered by the Japanese Royal Navy for the purpose of transporting the Yonemis from the Philippines to places like Mokum, Pussy Camp, and Shirkwater, Father Rock. His father was on the Toto Maru, and he was on Toto Maru. The guy we're going to speak about today, Freddie Elks, was on the Asian Maru. And today is a very significant day in the life. They were bombed by our own planes. They were bombed by the USS Hornet. The Oklahoma Room went down in Subic Bay, taking half the lives of the POWs. The POWs were told by the captain of the ship, You're on your own, swim to shore. They swam to shore, they got off the boat, and they were put in the tennis courts in Subic Bay. And they stayed there for three days until another ship came along, the Brazil Maru. They loaded one of the Brazil Maru for the continued journey. When that boat got hit, the Nora Maru was the boat of choice. And it got hit tight with dog. The Asian Maru, on this date, 79 years ago, sunk by the USS Shark. 14 were sunk by U.S. submarines. Average of 785 men per, per ship lost their lives. On the Asian Maru, 1,782 men were on board. Four escaped the flight boat, and four were, five were returned to the Japanese. I'll tell a little story about this boat. Pretty much dressed like <coughs> didn't have much to wear. So we're stuck on this boat. Freddie Elks is on the boat. He was marched down the dock from Billabong Prison Camp. <coughs> Put on the boat. And if you didn't go down the hole, they pushed you down the hole. And they covered the hole. He was on the boat 13 days, 200 miles north of Luzon, Shark County. This boat was 6,886 6, tons. It was about 600 feet long, 59 foot beam. It was one of the few. L ships was made and manufactured by the Japanese. Most of their boats were bought in the 1900, 1910, 1920, and they were bought from Scotland. They even took cruise ships and made, made them L ships. The Yoko Maru and the Sunday Bay had Japanese people in the cabins. They were trying to come back to Japan. They lost their lives too. Getting back to the Asian Maru, it could only steam at seven or eight knots. So when the pack left on this day, 
couple days before, 13 days before, it couldn't keep up. Most of the other steamers could keep up with 13, 14 knots, but with the destroyers and escort. And they would then steam together. Unfortunately, this boat couldn't steam at that rate. So rather than slow the convoy down, with possible attack by submarines, they sped up and left the Asian group. So. so roughly around three o'clock in the afternoon, shark found boat. At 4 5 in the afternoon, three torpedoes hit a broadside. Now, here's the interesting thing about it they didn't die because of torpedo attack. There's one something like the Titanic. As we all know, the Titanic didn't sink right away. This boat didn't sink right away either. We're still floating. The Japanese stores came alongside, and when the Japanese sailors got off the boat, Rescued by the Japanese explorers. Once that was complete, they left the POWs. And they went after the shark. They got the shark. They killed 57 men. That sucks. The hell ship, as you heard, it's not a very nice place to be. On top of that, compounding that was trying to get off the hell ship. It's a bit of a task. The four guys did. They got a lifeboat, made it back to China, and were graduated back to the United States. Five other ones got recaptured by the Japanese. Freddie, unfortunately, was lost at sea. Because when they tried to get off the boat, they were drowned. They were shot by the Japanese attempting to be rescued. Nine out of 1,782 survived. It took two hours and 40 minutes for the boat to sink. By 7:45 that night, the boat was underwater, and these men were either dead or in the water. This is probably the most well known atrocity in World War II done by the Japanese. But there were other boats lost, were lost by 14, 14 boats were lost. 1,100 guys were lost. In our museum, we have what we call the wall, not the wall, but we have the list. Unrecoverables. Freddie's on that list. He's also on the wall missing down to the National Cemetery in Manila. He was in three prison camps. We at the ABDC Museum have 1.5 million pages. We have 30,000 photographs. We have 10,000 3, 10, 3D objects. We have 352 books written by the ABDC. We have 1,500 diaries and documents written by the 1,700 related military books, 402 archive collections, and displays that are dedicated to local veterans. How do I know this? We count them all. We have to because we applied for a grant and we counted it so we could get the grant because we want to digitize 47,000 pages in this first grant. We're a resource for the department. Of of the DPAA, Department of Defense, POW Recovery Project. They'll, they'll come up and spend a week here and they will look for information regarding POWs that have been recovered. So when you hear on the, on the TV that they've recovered a person from Tarawa or a person from uh, Moncton or something like that, they may have gotten information from us. They spent a week up here to go through the records looking for conversations between POWs to find out where these guys were buried. We're a resource for the History Channel. 
I got a call one day and the guy says, Where's your machine's gold? I said, I have no idea. Yeah, well, somebody says, says Eddie Jackford goes over here. Like, no machine's gold. I said, Well, I'm going to call Eddie Jackford. We're coming up. I said, When are you coming up? He said, Saturday. Wait a minute. This is Thursday. So we came up and me and Rich went to talk to this guy. Next thing you know, they, they went up to Eddie Jackford's house, got his briefcase, and flew down to down the floor to talk to Ed because he were on the floor. We're not funded by the state, we're not funded by the government, we're not funded by the public donations to buy individuals like you. In support of the memory of those who served in their country. We're the largest collection of this kind outside of the National Archives. We work with museums as far away as Taiwan, and now we're working with one from Wyoming, I think it's Wyoming. They're going to have a Titanic regular display. They contacted us to provide them with information about the evidence. We edited books for authors. We helped them. We edited three books last year. And sometimes you have to, when you read these books, you'll find out that they get it wrong. So you have to get it right. No, MacArthur didn't leave on a submarine. He left on a PT. But that was a difficult year. But we edited books. We have researchers coming. We have researchers coming here next in two weeks. We spent three days researching information on this guy and his unit. I figured out his name. We just got a call from him. another museum. They want some more research done. So man and I are going to work on it next week. This is the deadline. Man looks our concern. Man looks our So, we dedicate this program today to this guy right here, PFC Frederick M.A. Phelps, United States Army Air Corps, 1927 1923. Nichols Field. You have to understand about Fred. Nichols Field was wiped out in the rain. He was a B 40 mechanic, the Chevette command. And his whole unit got wiped out. He's uh, he has what you call broken service too. He's he was a guy that spent 1927 to 1935 in uh, in the Philippines, and he got out and worked for a refrigeration company. And then he said in one of his letters, he said something's going on. It's not going to be good. And he's from South. Wheeling. And he was right. We have a museum, a document that says, we think it's going to be an amphibious landing on the Philippines, <coughs> October 1941. In the meantime, Doc Pearl, I don't know if you remember Doc Pearl from, from he says, I'm getting a pair of boots made, I'm getting a pair of white and linen suit made. And then within two months, he get captured with the over there. Just like Freddie. Freddie was on the tan. Freddie was in three prison camps. He ended up in Billabog prison camp, which was a which is a new bar fixing point for the health ships. They marched through the town, put them on the dock, and when the ship pulled up, get on board. Whatever you got, this is it. This is it. They would take the clothes off of the POWs and the health ships, keep the clothes for somebody else. It's terrible. It's terrible. But we are here to preserve that memory of those who survived and those who did not. And those who came back, and those who did not. We're very proud to do this in honor of those veterans. You got to keep in mind, too, right now, World War II veterans are dying at 131 people a day. And from what we 
gather recent sources, there are less than 50 POWs. That's it. But Fred was on the Asian road. He did not die because of torpedo. Shot over here. Four guys made it off. He made it back to the state. That's it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you to our audience. I know some of you may have to leave, but if anyone has any questions for our presenters, for Mary Kay, for Joe, or, or for Jim, um, ask them now if you uh, want, if you want to hang around afterwards. Uh, we just love to talk, so we can ask us all the questions we want. We'll be here for the rest of the afternoon. It's fine with us. So questions for uh, our presenters, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Today, how many Japanese companies have apologized? I don't know the number. I know that some uh, have one. Japanese uh, company Mitsubishi came to the United States. They actually visited the uh, the museum. They formally uh, apologized. They uh, gave the museum fifty thousand uh, uh, dollars, and to some of us, they gave a, the irony of this. I, I don't know a bottle of sake and three golf balls. So yeah, so right. What do you say? Thank you, but uh, but at least they came. They uh, and, and they did apologize, and they left us with some money. Many uh, Japanese have supported the defenders of Bataan and Corregidor uh, prisoners. Individual Japanese organizations. Some uh, Japanese students visited the the museum, and they were astounded because, of course, in Japan. They learned nothing about this uh, in history. And Eddie, who was uh, alive then, and he was a remarkable guy, one of the greatest compliments of my, I ever received in my life was Eddie saying, we think you're doing a pretty good job. Oh, damn, damn. I'm going to do better. But Eddie talked to these students for hours. He was in his 90s then, and they, they were enthralled by it. And of course, Eddie knew everything, and he recounted to them his experiences uh, uh, during uh, during captivity. Um, you know, please come to the museum, folks. We'd love to uh, uh, we'd love to have you drive up the river. Hey, go across to the Ohio side. Drive up there. And come across the New World Bridge. Even before you get to the museum. Uh, when you get to, uh, again, put on your GPS, or when you get to Wellsburg, turn left at the first light, uh, about a quarter mile, the post office is on your right, which is, it's Wellsburg, so it's a big old building. Turn left at the post office, go to the river, stop, uh, park, and uh, come on in. We're the door on the left. Um, we're there eight to four every weekday when you're coming up. Please give us the call because the day you decide to come is the day that we're out for pizza, for lunch, or something like that. So call. Anyway, more questions? Or again, come up afterwards and uh, 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 talk to us. I will say that the, the incident with Eddie, I could not believe, uh, nor I think could Sean, when we said, wait, Eddie, he died on October the 24th, and our presentation is October the 24th. Oh, wow. Yes, ma'am. Freddie, it's for real. Yes. And it's part of my husband's family. Oh. I think you're going to tell you that my husband's mom, uh, her parents uh, were married and his mother and his mother died. So, Eddie got married to Hazel, a 
a hazel is Freddie's brother. So hazel you know, is part of our family, but she was not in the blood or in marriage. But, uh, yeah, she, uh, so it's, we found when my, my dad died, all this stuff. And we brought it to Sean and we said, we don't know what this is, but this could be important. So Sean went ahead and he researched all this about her, and he found out you know, this is very important to God, so how much she And uh, so according to you know, whatever Sean did to make him come alive again, so when he goes to he was he was from Wheeling. You know, so that's a pretty pretty neat thing that you guys are keeping him alive too. Oh, we are, and so yeah. is and so is Sean, who uh, does that sort of great work, which is what we try to do at the museum with individuals. We try to keep them uh, alive and their contributions and uh, and their suffering. Um, the pictures uh, are there, their stories are there, diaries, uh, letters, uh, and so on. It's uh, the museum is a remarkable place. I'm so proud to have been lucky to have been associated with it, uh, Mary Kay way over uh, exaggerated my contributions. No. Yes, <laughs> Mary Kay had an argument after we're done here. Uh, and uh, anyway, so I, I'm honored to have been a part of it and to have the opportunity to be a part of it. I thank you again for your, uh, for, for your attendance and I thank all the presenters who I think you agree did uh, a terrific job I'm going to talk to Sean, and there's a whole other thing. We got civilian attorneys that we could uh, uh, talk about. So I'm going to lobby Sean for another program. Here. Thank you. 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 Thank it takes a collective mind, but it also takes two great board of directors and our interns. Thank you very much.